Good morning and welcome to Christchurch Cathedral for our second service under the vaccine passports today. A particularly warm welcome to our preacher today, who is the Reverend Richard, who's going to be talking about Barnabas. Please stand as we sing our first hymn on Jordan's Bank, the Baptist Cry. <laughs> Once more welcome, um, and you may have noticed, the sharp-eyed among you at least, that I am not Graham. Um, unfortunately, uh, just as I emerged from four days of Perda uh, on Friday, uh, Graham had to go into Perda because he had uh, a bit of a sore throat and a runny nose. He's had a Covid test, he's awaiting the results, he's self-isolating at home, but nobody thinks he's going to be... Uh, uh, suffering from COVID, it's just that we're being ultra cautious as I was earlier. So uh, just keep Graham and the Cathedral in your prayers at some stage, please. Grace and peace to you from God. God be with you with truth and joy. And joy. The Lord be with you. The Lord bless you. This, this is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. You are the Holy One, enthroned on the praises of your people. Our ancestors trusted in you, and you delivered them. They put their trust in you, and were not disappointed. Together, living God, you called your people out of it, and gave them the covenant. Prepare our hearts to hear your call. So of your son be your faithful people, now and forever. Amen. Let us pray. We say together the Collect for Purity. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit 
so that we may truly love you and worthily praise your holy name through our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Hear the teaching of Christ, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you. Spirit of God, search our hearts. Hear God's word to all who turn to Christ. Jesus said, Come to me, all who labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. God has promised forgiveness to all who truly repent, turn to Christ in faith, and are themselves forgiving. In silence, we call to mind our sins. Let us confess our sins. Together, merciful God, we have sinned in what we have thought and said, in the wrong we have done, and in the good we have not done. We have sinned in ignorance, we have sinned in weakness, we have sinned through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry, we repent and turn to you. Forgive us for our Saviour Christ's sake, and renew our lives to the glory of your name. Amen. Through the cross of Christ, God have mercy on you, pardon you, and set you free. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. God strengthen you with all goodness and keep you in life eternal. Amen. The peace of Christ rule in our hearts. The word of Christ dwell in us richly. Please be seated for the readings. The first lesson is from the book of Malachi, chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver he will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. Then the Lord will have men who will bring offerings in righteousness, and the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem will be acceptable to the Lord, as in days gone by, as in former years. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks, Thanks be to God.
The second lesson is from the first epistle of Paul to the Romans, chapter 5, beginning at verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. We stand to sing the gradual hymn, King of glory, King of peace, I will love thee. Yeah, the Holy Gospel according to Mark, the 10th chapter beginning at verse 25, 35. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you, he asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. When the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. This is the Gospel of Christ.
Shall we pray together? Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. 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 Please be seated. It's a great privilege to have a few moments to share, well, do something impossible, in fact, which is, as a man, multitask. And in that multitasking, I hope to say a little bit about the work of Barnabas Fund uh, and a little bit more about the texts that we've had read to us. If you want to know about the work of Barnabas Fund, in more detail, and I believe be inspired in both your prayers and in your relationship with the body of Christ across the globe, then um, to the left of all of you, I have a table at the back there with both leaflets and uh, books if you're interested to buy. But the leaflets and the magazine, uh, the literature we publish is absolutely free. And if you want to receive this, as a window into the work of Barnabas Fund, um, then you're very welcome to complete the form with your name and address, and we'd love to send you and inspire you in your Christian discipleship uh, with the work of Barnabas Fund across the globe. Uh, so my main uh, task this morning um, is to share with you what I've been uh, sharing across a number of churches and denominations, uh, which is a question. Uh, the question is, what can I or we learn from our brothers and sisters in Christ who are persecuted? What can I or we learn? And we're in that mode of being disciples together. I've tried to pull together a number of threads for this day, Advent being a time where we examine ourselves in the light of the appearing or returning of God himself. And that thunderous Old Testament passage reminds us that God will come to his temple and will purify those who are following him. That method of purifying is often, and I'm going to say it, through suffering. As I look round, I can see many and many a year of experience just by the color of your hair. I don't have that privilege myself, but I can bet this, although I'm not a betting man, I bet most of you will have learned the deepest and most profound lessons of what it means to follow Christ when you have suffered in some form and that he has brought you through that. And so with the Advent candle, some idiosyncratic, I know, some hope and faith, I'm going to try and say to you that one of the lessons that I believe that I, I'm learning and want to share with you is that biblical hope that is there in scripture but is often uh, exemplified in our brothers and sisters in Christ across the globe through suffering. I don't <coughs> put before you a philosophical treatise, but I've called this learning hope through a suffering church. Uh, I think there are, there's a space for a philosophical treatise, but not this morning. Uh, but I want to say that the Bible just assumes but as a Christian, that it's not a question of, of, of um, whether one suffers in following Christ, but it's a question of when. But more important than that is what do we learn through the process? And I want to say that entering into a relationship with God through faith, the candle of faith, through trusting in God, leads to this biblical hope. And I believe that the Romans passage helps us, for it mentions hope three times. 
But it begins with this. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. As we think about the, the candle of peace, if you like, this morning, uh, like the good exegetes of old, they would say that if you see the word therefore, you should at least have some thought as to what it is there for. And Paul has been explaining for some time that he's desperate to share his magnum opus, the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ in the metrop metropolis of Rome. He wants to use Rome as a stepping board to share this good news into Spain and further parts of the world. He wants to unite the Jewish and Gentile Christians in the faith. And so this is a long, long letter explaining the gospel or the good news. He wanted it to proclaim it in Rome and meets with other Christians because then he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it's the power of God for salvation to those who believe. In it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it's written, the just shall live by faith. And he begins to then extend the idea that every human being on the planet, sadly, has gone through the experience of the fall in our first parents, that terrible capital F, Fall, which led to us, um, as Paul begins to say, leading us to a foolish heart of darkness, a futility of thinking, because we've exchanged the truth of God for a lie, or we've exchanged the very creator himself for creation. And this has led to darkened practices, foolish thinking, where we not only self-harm, but harm our relationship with God and harm our relationship with neighbor, harm our relationship with ourselves, perverted thinking and replacing God with anything else is the sin of idolatry and leads to both perversion of thought and then perversion of practice. But then he has said that God himself chapter 3, verse 20, 21, has provided the answer in himself, in his Son, which we remember that he himself has borne that penalty and price and punishment of what we call sin. And that we, as Paul says in another place, are sinners by nature, children of wrath in Ephesians 2, will lead to a tremendous hope a hope that is exemplified in Father Abraham, who believed God's promises and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he spent some time in reaching this point to say, therefore, in the light of all of that, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Because in chapter 5, in verse 10, he had described a state of enmity, a state of rebellion in human hearts. Oh yes, on outwardly we look fine, but inwardly we shake our fists at God and don't want his way, his kingdom ways. We don't really want his son. We don't want him having any charge in our lives. We want to be gods. But Paul says at this stage, those who come to God through faith in Christ and what he has done, do you notice, have peace with God. Not waiting for it, we have that now. That's tremendous, isn't it? And then that leads us on to this marvellous, marvellous fact that we now live under a new regime of access to the grace of God, and that we stand and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. There it is. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. That's biblical hope. In trusting that what God has promised, he delivers. He had said that we had fallen short of the glory of God. But now through faith in Christ, we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. 
And this hope is a Christian reward. It's a gift. It's exemplified, actually, in Scripture in different ways. How does this hope work itself out? Well, the very James of James and John in Acts chapter 12, if you read the Bathian accounts, uh, you will read that its mum puts James and John up to the fact, saying he's been speaking about a kingdom, he's been speaking about important status of authority in the kingdom, why don't you ask him for the best seats in the house? And they do. James and John come up to Jesus and say, can we ask for something? And Jesus responds, can we have the best seats in the house and those positions of authority? To which Jesus, as he often did, answered with a question, can you be baptized with the baptism that I've been baptized with? Can you drink the cup? And they have absolutely no idea as they respond, of course we can. And yet here in Acts chapter 12, we find that it's Herod, Herod Agrippa, grandson of Herod the Great, there's a misnomer if ever there was, who wanted to please the Jews and at Passover time puts James to the sword. A prophecy fulfilled. Yes, he didn't die for the sins of the world, but he certainly drunk the cup of being a martyr witness. Not a martyr destroying other people's lives, but a martyr witnessing by his own death to the one who had died for him. That's martyrdom in the New Testament. Hope carrying through. In the same chapter, the Apostle Peter is also, because it's pleasing to Herod for the Jews, put in jail and is gloriously, gloriously delivered. One could spend a long time on that. Marvellous, marvellous story. Same hope, different consequences. And the New Testament teaches that this hope is a tremendous privilege. The Apostle Paul said on one occasion, if we have hope only in this life, we are of all people, authorised version, most miserable. But this hope will carry you through, will carry me through, will carry my brothers and sisters in Christ through whatever, persecution or deliverance. The word of the Lord increased, Luke says. It also reminds me that this hope is, is exemplified in historical characters, one of them a bishop, Ignatius, around about 110, thereabouts. He also is summoned to follow in the steps of his master. And along the way, he writes letters, seven of them, perhaps mirroring the letters of Revelation. But one of them is to Rome. And in chapter four of his letter, he says, I want to be ground as the pure bread of Christ. I want my sinews to be torn by the wild beasts. Now, if a current bishop, maybe Steve, writes an encyclical letter of that nature, we're dealing with a mental health issue, aren't we? Or has he picked up the biblical hope that nearness to God and intimacy with God is often, often, both anecdotally and taught in Scripture? Intimacy with God. Where would you get such teaching from? Who would dare to see, teach stuff, such stuff? Blessed are you when you are persecuted for righteousness. And that same Apostle Peter, who later did indeed drink the cup of his master, would say, Beloved, don't be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, to purify you to refine you, as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. And one could develop that much more. This is a gift of hope, and a hope that will take you through things that you can't imagine, probably, at Barnabas Fund, we, we try to be as efficient 
as we can. We don't send people in the traditional sense, although we have a network of people across the globe who are responsible for large sections of the globe where Christians are persecuted. We do send money where it's necessary, although it's becoming increasingly difficult to do that in some parts of the world, India, Lebanon in particular, sanctions of the United States have, are they intended or unintended consequences where one cannot literally send money to help? And so often we'll send food or something else. We encourage prayer. Barnabas Fund operates on pretty much every continent and in those places where other NGOs can't often operate because we have a close network of working with Christians, through Christians, to Christians. They know where the need is. They know where that fund can best be used for alleviation of suffering. Barnabas has a broad uh, work, whether it's infrastructural or Christian workers or medical care or dealing with victims of violence or basic needs. Recently, it's putting courses online accessible to parts of the world that wouldn't have that access. Some theological courses, some practical courses. Why? Because in a COVID world, if you're a, if you're a minister or you're a pastor and you can't meet because of COVID, you won't get paid. And so we're putting on some very practical horticultural courses, business management, things like that, which are accessible through, in India, Serampore University, South Africa, Stellenbosch, in some of the Southeast Asian and, and Middle Asian countries, through the Stan countries. We have a broad, broad work, but quite frankly, the work gets much, much deeper and in much greater need. As Christian persecution is just not in those traditional places, but is everywhere. Because Paul then goes on to say, not only that, as if this Christian hope weren't enough, there's much more to it than that. Because now that I've explained to you what it means to enter into a relationship with God through Christ, and faith has brought you there, this hope is even more marvelous. Because he says, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, there it goes again, knowing that suffering produces endurance, endurance produces character, character produces hope. I have a, uh, well, he's my best man, or was my best man, and he used to have a poster above his bed. It was of a, a two or three-toed sloth. It was sort of wrapped around the chair, and above it were the words, if only I could get that sense of achievement, dot, 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 without actually achieving anything. And some of us want to, want the Christian hope without the steps that often lead to it, the endurance, the producing of character. That word is the refining process within metallurgy, the showing what's the real thing or what's really valuable under pressure. And Paul says that this hope is produced in people who have faith in Christ and is shown. And I want to read a story to you just before a final point. Everybody likes a story, don't they? Because this evidence and exemplifying of the Christian hope is lived out and shown and demonstrated day by day in parts of the world in ways that we couldn't believe. Well, here's one example. A group of 500 Nigerian Muslim background Christians who gathered together for safety after a string of Boko Haram attacks were later attacked again by the Islamist militant group. Most escaped apart from the 76 men, women, and children who were taken captive according to a Barnabas Fund contact. The 76 were taken to a Boko Haram terrorist camp where they were tortured. 
The four male leaders of the group were told at gunpoint to renounce their faith in Christ and revert to Islam. When they refused, holding fast to their saviour, the men were shot in front of their families and friends. The following week, the wives of the four martyred men were also ordered to renounce their faith or their children would be executed. As the mothers struggled under this terrible burden into the night, the children came running in and said that the Lord Jesus had appeared to them and all would be well. According to the account, the Lord Jesus then appeared to all of the group and told them not to fear, that he would protect them, that they should not renounce him, but stay strong, knowing he is the way, the truth, and the life. The next morning, the children, one girl as young as four, were lined up against a wall by the terrorists, and their four mothers were told they could save them if they renounced Jesus Christ and returned to Islam. The mothers refused. The soldiers cocked their rifles and prepared to take aim, when they suddenly started to grab at their heads, screaming, snakes, snakes. Some ran away, others dropped dead where they stood. As one of the soldiers fell down dead, a Christian captive reached down to pick up the soldier's gun to fire at the fleeing Boko Haram militants. But the youngest child put her hand on his arm and said, you don't need to do that. Can you not see the men in white fighting for us? What a tremendous story. The Barnabas stories are well sourced, they're well written, they're not embellished. But this would be a story amongst 20 of other occasions where some had the privilege of being martyred online. Here is one of a pastor and dummy. You can see the Daesh um, flag in the background. Or this man here on the streets of London, having the temerity to read John's gospel and then upsetting someone and that person telling the police that they were upset and then the police arresting this man. Later on, they had to de-arrest him because they weren't quite sure of the interpretation of the law, but that did not prevent them as he cried, not my Bible, don't take my Bible away from me, and them saying, you should have thought of that before you started preaching. Well, coming to your shores shortly, the gagging of the Christian message. You see, persecution or suffering has many forms, and it is very, very near us in all sorts of circumstances. The final point is this. Paul said that in his third mention of hope, and remember, we're thinking about a hope that is given to us. We're thinking about a hope that is learned through experience, sometimes a purifying experience. Or a hope, as he says here, hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Paul will now say, as he took up this um, image in 1 Corinthians 12, the incomprehensibility of one part of the body saying to another part of the body, I don't need you. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. Not if you've been baptized into Christ, into one body, and drink of the same spirit. Just because you're thousands of miles away doesn't make you less a person. Sometimes I'm dramatic in this sermon, and I will name people and say, I don't need you, and look at the offense on their face as I say, who does he think he is? Well, my sermon, as I've kind of preached it a number of times across a number of de denominations is teaching me this. 
is that I need to learn what God is teaching my brothers and sisters in Christ. The persecuted church or the suffering church is often the Cinderella of everyone's interests. And sometimes could it be that you and I, not to the person sitting next to us in the pew saying, I don't need you, could it possibly be that sometimes we say to our brothers and sisters in Christ, I don't need you. And yet we need to learn perhaps the most from them of these Christian virtues, faith, hope, through suffering. I'm going to take another 45 seconds to show to you one of our latest initiatives in Barnabas, but I want to encourage you, please, please be informed Please be transformed. Please be reformed. Please be inspired by learning about our brothers and sisters in Christ and saying, actually, I need you. You're very welcome to find out more after the service. I'll be standing by the table if you want to learn more. Love to talk to you about that. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, thank you for the great, great privilege of knowing you through faith in your Son and all that he has done. We entrust ourselves entirely to you. Thank you for the tremendous hope that you have placed in our hearts through the good news of Jesus Christ. Now may we learn to live that hope even in these days in our culture and may may we encourage those who live out the same hope across the globe to the glory and honour of your name In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Richard. We now stand to affirm that faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified and has spoken through the prophets. We believe in the Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. 
Amen. Let us pray. Lord, you have told us that we only need to ask for what we need. In this season of Advent, we pray that we can stay attentive to what really matters without being distracted by trivial things. Help us to set our priorities and focus on them to fulfill your purposes in our lives. This is a season of attention on material possessions. Help us to remember that there are so many people in the world and even in New Zealand without the resources to meet even their most basic needs. Lord, in your mercy. Christmas is not a time or a season, but a state of mind. To cherish peace and goodwill, to be generous in mercy, is to have the real spirit of Christmas. Today, we have lit the candle of peace. We pray for peace in all situations, thinking about the way the stress of Christmas sometimes leads to an upsurge in domestic violence. We pray that this year, every child has a memorable Christmas for all the right reasons. We pray for Christians around the world who don't enjoy the freedom to worship as we do. We pray especially for those who experience discrimination, oppression and persecution as a consequence of their Christian faith. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray for our own church and city as New Zealand implements a new system of vaccination passports. We ask that you will soothe the division that this has caused in our society. Help us to respect each other's views and find loving ways to connect with each other. Lord, please especially be with those taking on welcoming roles in our church. Protect them from conflict and help them to lead visitors to feel your love and protection. We pray for ourselves, for freedom from all that burdens us, past mistakes, fears, destructive habits, hurts that others have inflicted on us. We ask for joy and a sense of humour this Christmas. We ask these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, as we say together the prayer that he taught us. Page 11. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Please stand. The peace of Christ be always with you. At Ifana, we are the body of Christ. Keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And it's an opportunity to greet one another in any way we may wish now, because we're COVID passported. We worship God with our tithes and offerings as we sing hymn number 40, Ye Servants of the Lord, Each in His Office Wait.
God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer, we receive these gifts and these intercessions in thy name. Amen. To you, Lord, belongs the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. The Lord is here. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right indeed. It is our joy and our salvation, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, at all times and in all places, to give you thanks and praise through Christ, your only Son. You are the source of all life and goodness. Through your eternal word, you have created all things from the beginning and formed us in your own image. Male and female, you created us. Therefore, with the faithful who rest in him, with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name forever praising you and singing. All glory and thanksgiving to you, Holy Father. On the night before he died, your son, Jesus Christ, took bread. When he had given you thanks, he broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this to remember me. And after supper, he took the cup. When he'd given you thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it to remember me.
Therefore, loving God, recalling your great goodness to us in Christ, his suffering and death, his resurrection and ascension, and looking for his coming in glory, we celebrate our redemption with this bread of life and this cup of salvation. Accept our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, which we offer through Christ, our great high priest. Send your Holy Spirit that these gifts of bread and wine which we receive may be to us the body and blood of Christ, and that we, filled with the Spirit's grace and power, may be renewed for the service of your kingdom. United in Christ with all who stand before you in earth and heaven, we worship you, O God, in songs of everlasting praise. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. We do not presume to come to your holy table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your great mercy. We are not worthy even to gather the crumbs from under your table, but you are the same Lord whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the body of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen. Holy Communion will be celebrated at the chancel steps. If you could please come up the outside aisle and return down the centre aisle, that would be very helpful. Draw near and receive the body and blood of our Saviour Jesus Christ in remembrance that he died for us. Let us feed on him in our hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Let us pray. Almighty God, giver of all good things, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the precious body and blood of our Saviour Jesus Christ. We thank you for your love and care in assuring us of your gift of eternal life and uniting us with the blessed company of all faithful people. Therefore, ever-living God, keep us steadfast in your holy fellowship. And now we offer ourselves all that we have and are to serve you faithfully in the world through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honour and glory, now and forever. Amen. And the blessing of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you, those you remember, those you love, and those you pray for, now and evermore. Amen. I'll draw your attention to some of the notices in the Pew's News which have been circulated. Basically, uh, we're still not sure what we're going to be doing over Christmas because of the change in COVID situation. There certainly will not be carols on the steps, but there's a possibility of doing two services on Christmas Eve instead. But we've got to see exactly what the situation is and exactly what personnel we've got. Also, uh, from now on, on vaccine passport services, we are able to have refreshments. Uh, we can't this time because we can't get a team together in time. But uh, going forward, we will be having refreshments after most services. Please stand for our final hymn, Guide Me, O Thou Great Redeemer.
Go now to love and serve the Lord. Go in peace. Amen. Amen. We go in the name of Christ. Christ.